to have a new start with God and as we prepare to take the communion, uh, you know, God wants us to get ourselves right with ourselves and ourselves right with Him and ourselves right with all the people in our lives. And this is so important. We uh, can't afford to hold any grudges. Uh, we can't afford to let anger remain in our hearts uh, because it says that anger remains in the heart of a fool unless you want to be a fool. Uh, but fools stay angry and don't forgive. It's a foolish thing to do because when we do that, we're keeping toxins inside ourselves and poisoning ourselves. We all have situations that seem unfair and make us angry. Life is not always fair. God is fair, but life is not always fair. And we need to understand this. But God promised in his word that if we'd stay in faith and keep a good attitude, that he would turn around the unfair things and not only uh, pay us back for the unfair things that have happened to us, but he said he'd give us double. And all you have to do is read the story of Job to see that. Because all the things that happened to Job were unfair. It was nothing he deserved. And the Bible is very clear about that. So sometimes when you're being the right way and you're doing all the right things, unfair things still happen. And that's confusing to us at times. It doesn't make sense. But this is where faith and trust comes is when it doesn't make sense. We still trust that God is good and that he will make right all that which is wrong. And so this is an interesting thing. So I'm going to share some things about communion that you may have not maybe pieced together because the Bible is like a puzzle. And there's all kinds of things in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And when you put the puzzle together, it all makes sense. So I'm going to start today by going to the Psalms. And so if you would uh, open your Bibles to Psalm 4, it talks about communion in a different way than maybe you thought of. It's really the starting point if you want to have communion with God. Now when we read Psalm 4, it will show us how to have communion with God. And so... Um, you know that a lot of the psalms are talking about going through hard things, by the way. And the psalms are not just saying everything's great all the time. So let's read this. Psalm 4 is where we're at. Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. You have enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. So when it says that God has enlarged him. He says, you have enlarged me when I was in distress. What's that saying is to be enlarged in the Bible means to be blessed. And it's saying that God is going to bless us even during the stressful times, even during the difficult times. He's not going to just bless us during the easy times. He's going to bless us during the hard times. There are hard times. That's part of reality. And if we pray that, uh, then we'll never have any hard times. Uh, I'm not so sure that prayer is going to get answered because the Bible already tells us that uh, we're all going to go through hard times. This is the test of your faith. And uh, if you know anybody who's never gone through anything difficult, let me know. I'd like to meet them. Because so far, uh, I, what I found is everybody is going through something. Everybody. And so the thing is, we don't want to just go through it. We want to grow through it. Because pain with a purpose is not wasted pain. And so as we read on, he says he's going to bless them during the hard times. And then he, he talks about the people who don't love God. He says, you sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? And leasing in the, in the Old Testament means lying. So 
it's saying, how, how long will you pursue lies? How long will you pursue vanities? And here's an example. Uh, Jesus said to lay up treasure in heaven and to put your treasure in the things that don't rust and don't corrupt. And this week, God's been talking to me about rust because um, earlier in the week, our faucet and our sink rusted out. And the water was squirting everywhere. And um, thankfully, Dustin came and blessed us and put a new faucet in. Thank, thank you, Dustin. But then today, this morning, when we got up, we went to go out the door, and the doorknob came off, and it was completely rusted. So, what's going on here? Well, Jesus said, to not put all your effort into the things that are going to rust and corrupt. And rust never sleeps, it just keeps going and things rust out. If you can preserve your car forever, let me know the secret. Maybe if you live in California, you have a better chance. But things rust out. And so it says, put your treasure in heaven where things don't rust and corrupt. See, the interesting thing is when it talks about salvation, shh, too loud, be quiet. Okay, so in the Bible, when it says rust corrupts, it says to put your investment in the things that do not corrupt. And when it talks about eternal life, it says, that God will cause his Holy One, Jesus, not to see corruption. And so we don't want to see corruption either. And it says through Jesus Christ, we have eternal life and we will not see corruption. See, rust is corruption. Something that was once good, rust and wears away. And so as we look on here, when it says, how long will you love vanity? It's loving the things that are going to corrupt. I heard a song on the radio called, I Love My Car. That's a song. And uh, that's nice, but the car's going to rust. It's going to corrupt. And so it says to put our affection on the things that are eternal. And in order to do that, we have to be spiritually minded, not carnally minded. If we're only thinking of the things of this life, and that's where all our focus is, then we'll miss it. And so as we read on in the psalm, it says, But you know that the Lord, but know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. So it says, the Lord is listening. And this is so important to know this scripture because a lot of times I hear people saying, is God even listening? Is he listening? The answer is yes. Let's read that again. The Lord will hear when I call to him. So God is listening. But the question, it's a two-way Street, Are we listening to what God is saying to us? Now the next verse talks about the communion. And if you don't do what it says in, in the next verse, you will not be able to have real communion with God. So this next verse is a key scripture. And we're going to go deep into it and understand what it's really saying here. It says, stand in awe and sin not and commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Now, it's talking about communion there, but maybe not in a way we normally think of communion and 
we have the opportunity to do this today. It says, commune with your own heart. See, if you are disconnected from your own heart, which many people are, you will surprise yourself and say, I don't know what got into me. I don't know why I did that. You will be disconnected. You will not understand the issues of your own life. You'll find yourself exploding out of nowhere with anger and all kinds of things happen that you didn't know were going to happen because some people I've heard say things like this. I'm really angry and I don't know why. See, that's a person who's disconnected from their own heart. And so this is why we need to first commune with our own heart before we can have communion with God. Because if we don't even know what's going on inside ourselves, if we don't even know ourselves, how can we connect with God? If we don't even know when we have anger in our heart because we've stuffed it down and we've buried it for so long, how are we going to get rid of it? If we don't even know we have addiction issues in our heart, how are we going to deal with it? If we don't know that we have unforgiveness in our heart, how are we going to deal with it? So we have to commune with our own heart. And the way that the Bible says to do that is it says to be still and be quiet. And it says the best time to do this is not in a pew, but when you're laying on your bed alone. You just lay there and you ponder, and what's going on inside of me right now? And what really matters to me? And why am I living? What is my motivation? What am I living for? Am I really living a living sacrifice to God to serve Him? Or am I living for other things? What are the true desires of my heart? And God wants us to search our heart, not so we'll be under condemnation, because, as you know, Peter read just earlier, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. But the reason we search our heart is so that we can find out if our heart is in the place it's supposed to be. You will have heard the saying, their heart is in the right place. But even when your heart is in the right place, you could still do the wrong thing. And this is why we need God. Because as you can see here, it says, offer the sacrifice of righteousness and then put your trust in the Lord. There are many things in life that we can't fix. And if we lie to ourselves and convince ourselves that we can fix something we can't fix, we will be wasting a lot of time. And just to give you a few examples of this, you cannot fix another person's heart. You cannot make another person be the right way. You cannot make another person do the right thing. And even more profoundly, you cannot make anybody love you. So this is all some heavy stuff, but God wants us to work it through because the answers are already there in you. Remember, Jesus said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God has put strength in you and he's put the blessing and the ability to forgive and the ability to become righteous, but we have to be connected to the Lord and to our own heart. When there's disconnect, we can't get it right. This is why David said to the Lord himself, David was aware that he could do wrong things without realizing it. He said, search my heart, God, and see if there's anything bad in there. A lot of people are afraid to pray a prayer like that. Because they say, if I ask God to search my heart, and then if I find out there's something bad in my heart, I don't like that. I don't want to face myself. 
But you know, there's one person you will never be able to get away from. There's a lot of people you can get away from. Say, I don't like this person, I'm gonna stay away from them. That's good. If somebody's toxic, stay away from them. But there's one person you will never be able to get away from. You will never be able to get away from you. And in the end, it's with you you have to live. You have to live with yourself. And so this is not little stuff here. This is big stuff because if we will let God shine his light into our heart, yes, you will find there are some things, some dark spots, some things that aren't maybe the way they're supposed to be. But here's the good news. It says that God will transform us from darkness to light. So we don't need to be afraid of the darkness. We need to face it head on and know that God's light will overcome any darkness. You'll notice that the people that God picks to do his work are often people who have issues. They don't have it all together, but God picks them anyway. And he does a good work in us as we allow him to. But giving God access to your heart is the key. To not just give God a part of your heart, but all of it. And so as Peter's passing out the communion, let's prepare ourselves. You know, the amazing thing about the Lord that makes him unique from the rest of us, and this is why the Lord tells us never to judge other people, what is the unique thing about the Lord? The Lord is the only one who can perfectly and clearly see what is in each person's heart. And so with God, he can never fool God. People can fool other people, but you can never, ever, ever fool God. And the thing is, if you truly believe that the Lord is your friend, you will not be afraid for him to shine the light on you. Why do people turn away from God? Why do some people stay away? It says, because they loved the dark. They loved darkness instead of light. If you want to be in the light, then you have to love the darkness no more and love the light. And I have talked to people who love darkness. There's a false comfort in darkness, a false protection in darkness. People can't see you when you're in the dark. People can't see you when you're in the dark. But it says that God can see you when you're in the dark because to God, the darkness is as the day. So with God, the best thing to do is lay it out on the table. Here it is, God. Here it is. And when we do this, he's pleased because he would prefer honesty and truth and righteousness over religious sacrifices where people try to make up. I'll make it up to you, God, for what I did wrong. That's the wrong approach. The right approach is you lay it on the table and you let God make you righteous. And then we'll be able to say with confidence these words, I am the righteousness of God in Jesus. Can you say that with me? I am the righteousness of God in Jesus. Now, if you try to have righteousness without the Lord, you can read in the Psalms and Proverbs, it says our own righteousness is as filthy rags. So we come to this place 
where it's, it's true humility. So read that scripture once more. Psalm 4.4, 4. again, it says, commune with your own heart. That means meditating and letting God show you what's really in your heart and whether your heart is right with God. And so I'm going to give you a, a couple minutes to do that. I'm just going to play some meditational music for a minute or two so you have a chance to do that. And then we will take the communion for the new year, for a new start. And most of you probably know that New Year's resolutions most of the time only last for about a month. They, they've done surveys and studies on this, and they, a person makes a promise to themselves, and then they're not able to keep it, and then they're disappointed in themselves. So instead of making a promise to yourself, we need to come to the place of real humility where the Lord says, you can do nothing without me. We can't get it right without the Lord. And so if you come to the Lord instead of making promises to yourself and say, Lord, I can't get it right without you. So I'm asking for you to do what I can't do. And then your I can't will become an I can. And here's the I can. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. And am I gonna ask you to say it? Yes. Let's say it together. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. But if you don't know something's wrong, you can't make it right. So even that, we need God to open our eyes. Okay, so take a couple minutes to meditate upon the Lord and allow him to do his awesome work in us. And notice I said, in us.
let's stand together by faith, inviting the Lord to do his good work in us. Lord, as we come to you this morning, we ask, we ask that you create clean hearts in us and renew right spirits. And when we receive this by faith in the name of Jesus, forgiving ourselves, forgiving others, and forgiving everyone. And let now your love be poured out upon us and your cleansing and your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so just going to end with a song, which is about not leaving your first love. It's called Still 